So Dean, what's uh, in your opinion is the current state of the PV market from a material supplier's perspective? Well Warren, actually it's kind of interesting because the market looks a little you know, less than ideal from, uh, from, from many perspectives, but uh, the reality is from a material perspective, uh, our fortunes tend to lag maybe one or two years behind the uh, you know, first you know, wave of investment. Uh, because of course people install equipment and then they ramp up and it takes some time to get to capacity which is where our uh, our business tends to kick in so uh, actually for us 2009 will be a very good year um, and as it will be for all our competitors and, and other people in, in our industry uh, because we're really uh, benefiting from the the wave of investment that happened in 2008 and early part of 2009 and um, so yes I think 2009 will be a good year 2010 will be a good year 2011 of course a little bit uncertain still at this stage. Okay. And uh, do you think uh, PV manufacturers are continuing to add capacity or is there more of an emphasis on improving the yield and boosting performance now? Uh, generally, of course, I mean, we have to recognise that the focus at the moment is very much on, 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 on challenging the cost base so that people can compete, compete uh, in the new world that is, uh, that is, that, that is the module pricing of, of 2009. Uh, having said that, however, uh, there still are significant pockets of capacity addition. Some are geographic and some are technology based. Uh, China, for example, continues to, uh, to invest in new capacity. Uh, thin film uh, producers who invested in 2008, 2000, early 2009 are now working hard to ramp up that capacity. Um, and of course the US represents a tremendous uh, source of optimism for the, for the short and medium term. Uh, and in the, in, in the recent um, at the recent deadline for, for, for applications for funds under the stimulus package, uh, there were more than 20 applications made for, for new uh, solar capacity investments in the US. And can you see a difference in the current fortunes between crystalline silicon and the thin film silicon manufacturers? Again, quite a clear answer on this one, I think. Um, there's no doubt that you know, crystalline having scale and volume uh, is dealing with a different issue right now. Uh, they're dealing with uh, coping in an environment where prices are lower but they have scale and they have production issues, uh, scale and production capacity and capabilities. Uh, so their challenges are very much about leveraging you know, reductions in polysilicon prices to ensure that they can still operate um, you know, at least healthily in, in the current uh, production and the current module pricing environment. For thin film, uh, this um, financial crisis has come at a time when they were still getting started and therefore they're dealing with new technology startups, new operational establishment uh, and uh, at the same time dealing with a, an urgent need uh, to address cost reduction. Uh, so I think the, challenge, the scale of challenge for the thin film manufacturers is, is quite considerable. Um, but I think one thing that we've seen from this show uh, is a mood of increasing optimism. People feel that they have a path to, to get to where they need to be uh, and on both sides of the fence, both crystalline and film silicon and actually if we even add a third side, uh, the, the new technologies, everybody consistently uh, is telling us that they believe they can get to the point where they need to get to, uh, to sustain in this market. Okay. And uh, you, what were the major projects uh, last year for you and where, where are you with them now? Well, 2008 of course was a really interesting year in this industry. There were some tremendously large and optimistic and aggressive announcements. You know, one year on, some of those have clearly gone away. Uh, the financial crisis has, has, has removed sources of funding that, were, that would have been critical to allow them to go ahead. Having said that, many did go ahead. Uh, in particular, some of the major crystalline investments in, in China are you know, largely installed and, and, and either nearing readiness for production or already in production. Um, you know, not, not relevant for us personally, but in, uh, in, in, in Japan, Sharp proceeded with their very large investment in, uh, in, in Sakai. Uh, in, here in Germany, um, Bosch, despite the financial crisis, continued to plow ahead and, and, and have you know, taken uh, significant steps forward in their, in their plan for you know, more than 600 mega, megawatts. Um, so many of the big projects are still going ahead, which is an, interest, which is an interesting thing to note in, the, in an environment like we've got at the moment where you know, in many, many other industries people are pulling back from virtually all investment. We still see uh, people believing in the future of PV to the extent that they're willing to commit very large amounts of money. And on a regional basis, where is the current activity? Well, the financial crisis for the last 12 months has tended to govern you know, most things in the world and, and you know, it, in truth we have to recognise that PV hasn't really been significantly different. So for the last 12 months I would say that we have seen a slowdown in most places. 
uh, China perhaps being the biggest exception. Uh, availability of funds in China probably has been less affected than anywhere else in the world. Uh, so despite the, uh, the financial crisis, uh, we still see a significant amount of investment in new capacity and ramping of existing capacity in China. Of course, that has an impact on, on you know, the, the, the people that are already producing in China and, and, and they're, you know, clearly we see, we, we see Chinese producers uh, leading behavior in, in significant areas of the whole market. Uh, we touched on this before, but in uh, 2010 is expected to be a strong year for growth in the US. What do you see happening there? And do you think, well, what do you, what do you see happening when the stimulus packages kick in? Okay. Well, the US will obviously be a very large market for PV. Uh, the only question really is when. So we had the stimulus package in 2009, which offers tremendous promise. Unfortunately, the, the mechanism for disbursement of the funds hasn't come through quite as quickly as many people had hoped. So the first thing to say is that in 2009, we will see virtually no impact, very, very little impact. What in 2008 was, a, was perhaps a 300, a 300 megawatt market, in 2009 maybe perhaps a 400 megawatt market. Uh, in 2010, uh, we will definitely see the beginning of the impact. But most analysts would now suggest that it's unlikely to be the two or three gigawatt impact that we had originally hoped for. Perhaps we'll see a gigawatt of, of end customer demand or end project demand in 2010. But from 2011, um, I think the consensus now emerging again is that we will see the US really take its place at the, at, at the head of, you know, the, or at the forefront of, of markets in the, for PV. And, you know, it may even surpass, well, it, it seems very likely to surpass Germany ultimately. Uh, it, may do it, it may do so as early as 2011 or 2012 as a market. Um, do you think you could update us on the developments taking place in respect to flooring? 2009 has been a great year for flooring. Um, I think the, the combination of the environmental benefit and the performance benefit that comes with flooring uh, has, has seen us get great traction. Um, We've, uh, we've, we've, we've now tested it in the field on, on two major OEM platforms um, and we've put it through, we, we've done extensive work on our own, uh, it, through our own joint development program with Malibu and, and the consequence of that is that we've, uh, we've, I think we've publicly announced already, uh, we will roll Florian out in a production setting with Malibu in the Thin Film, uh, in their Thin Film Fab in Osterwedding this year. Um, further, I, you know, this, the, the interest that we're seeing at this show uh, for it I, we see it building con con constantly, and, and in fact, actually, the level of interest this week has been rather overwhelming. And uh, with respect to Slight Lane, um, are the fears of short supply now over? I would say unequivocally, the Slight Lane shortage is over. Um, uh, there's a couple of effects behind it. Um, Clearly, the polysilicon shortage is over, and you know, in case anybody doesn't understand, uh, silane comes predominantly from polysilicon manufacturers. They produce it as part of their production process uh, for making polysilicon. And as the pressure on polysilicon supply has diminished, so much more silane is available for release into the, into the merchant silane market. At the same time, we have a slowdown in the market, which has kind of, which has flattened the ramp a little bit of, uh, of, of, of many fabs, and, and the demand has, uh, has fallen as a result. And the third factor is uh, the shortage situation that we had for the last 18 months uh, has attracted many new entrants and some new investments. So the combination of their capacity coming online in 2010, including some from ourselves, uh, more, more product available in the market, uh, those two factors predominantly uh, have, ha, are acting to say that we will not have a, sh a silane shortage in the next at least three years uh, and maybe as long as five years we're adequately served. And uh, what's the current state of uh, your own investments in silane? Um, our own situation is that we, we, we've proceeded with only one significant step into production, uh, which is a, an alliance that we have with, uh, with a company here in Germany, uh, Schmidt. Um, that's something we've publicly announced some time ago. Uh, everything is proceeding on track. Uh, we did deliberately slow down progress, uh, or our partner deliberately slowed down progress in response to the market, but uh, we will ha that, that plant will come online early in 2010. Uh, and at the time, it will be the only or the first uh, production facility serve, serving the, uh, the, the merchant market and serving PV customers uh, in Europe. Uh, beyond that, um, we are looking at a number of strategic options. 
Um, the world has changed since we started that process 12 months ago, and therefore we, 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 we constantly reevaluate, re you know, in line with the dynamics. Um, but the one thing I would say that's absolute is that this, the decision that we make around our next strategic move in Siling uh, will only be with a partner uh, who is aligned to the same clear cost reduction roadmap for the PV industry that we're working to. And uh, finally, what sort of further developments have you got in the pipeline? Well, if you look around this area where you're sitting, I think you'll see, it, you'll see the word sustainability appear many times. Uh, it really is a, a theme that is at the heart and at the core of, of how Lindy operates. And it's a personal passion for many of the people involved in the solar business. Um, so I think our, our, our next contribution to that area, after fluorine, which we've already talked about, uh, will be to look at some of the materials used in crystal. Uh, Monocrystalline we see as being a, uh, as, as, as receiving a great resurgence perhaps over the next couple of years as a market polarizes between high efficiency, high, high, high um, performance and extremely low cost. Uh, and mono of course being at one end of that scale. Now many of the chemicals uh, involved in mono uh, will be used in very large volume and one of, the, one of, them, one of them is of particular interest to us. Uh, that one being potassium hydroxide, KOH. Um, KOH is interesting because the primary use for KOH in the world today is in the production of fertilizers. And this is a material that isn't exactly abundant. Uh, over the last two or three years we have seen periodic shortages and price, price escalations etc. Uh, and one of the main drivers for that has been increasing use in PV. Uh, now mono, monofabs today are a significant uh, consumer of KOH in the world. However, it's only about two or three percent efficient. So on the one hand, we have this large consumer of a material that is fundamentally perhaps in conflict with the food chain, um, being used rather inefficiently for the production of you know, solar devices, which are of course of great benefit to the world as well. Um, but the fact that it is so efficient in, its, uh, in, in, in the production process means that there is an opportunity to, uh, to step in and do something around recycling or uh, repurification of that material. Uh, of course, we'll reduce the consumption in the meantime, uh, but also we'll, we'll eliminate a large amount of, of downstream waste treatment, which actually has further knock-on effects, because even after you, uh, you treat KOH as it comes out, it can, even the treated material can still have some impact on the, on the water system. Um, now, one thing I would say is that sustainability is a word that has many meanings, and sustainability in PV is also about cost, because you know, for the industry to live, it has to keep reducing costs. So, uh, we don't believe in a hair shirt approach to sustainability. We believe that it has to be you know, cost effective as well, uh, a sugar coating of the pill if you like. Uh, so therefore the areas that we're focusing on are the, are the ones that, you know, there's a technology piece that we can bring which, which adds a real environmental benefit, but we're also looking for the win-win which gives the, the cost benefit as well. Um, KOH Recycle we think is the next one.